Okay, we're right back again. This is Paul and Jay. Uh, we're going to move right into this material. It's uh, This is probably the most exciting part, and you're going to enjoy what Paul has to say. You may not like what he's going to say. You may not even agree with what he's going to say, but he is going to say it, and you're going to respond, and that's where you're going to uh, engage that uh, you with him in the comments at the bottom. So right back to Paul. This is now the historical scenario that you're now going to show just what was happening there in the seventh century to help us understand how this, how really all of this took place, because we don't trust the ninth and 10th century. We do trust the seventh. I've asked you to go to the seventh century, and now you're going to give us that scenario from that period in that place. Over to you, Paul. Okay. Um, right. Well, uh, the Romans had uh, destroyed the Jerusalem temple in AD 73 and had forbidden Jewish worship on the site from that time onwards. And the Jew, uh, of course, the Roman Empire, pagan Roman Empire, then later converted to Christianity. But the Jews had never been allowed to return to Temple Mount, and they'd generally been treated very badly by by the Jerusalem uh, by the Byzantine Empire. So, um, so from a Jewish perspective, um, the longing to return to Temple Mount must have been uh, must have been extraordinarily strong. Possibly the thing that kept the Jewish people. Uh, together, the, the, the hope and the belief that one day they would return to Jerusalem. So from uh, 602, in 602, we have the outbreak of the byzantine Sasanian War. Um, this is uh, that little triangle that you see appearing on the screen uh, is a quarter of the Sasanian flag, if anyone doesn't recognize it, and the, the little flag with the uh, cross and the four look like letter Bs, uh, that is the uh, Byzantine flag, which is flying proudly over Jerusalem. So 602, um, Khosrow II um, uh, declares war on the Byzantine Empire and, and he invades um, from the east. Now, 614, um, there seems to be something that I call uh, a Jewish revolt. Um, it's the, the, the historical sources are a little bit murky. Um, it's uh, reputedly led by somebody called Nehemiah ben Hushiel, although there are people out there who do deny that Nehemiah ben Hushiel even exists, that he might be a later um, pious creation. But anyway, there is a Jewish revolt in uh, Jerusalem, there's street fighting. Um, and, and the Byzantine authorities lose control of the situation and there is door-to-door uh, -door fighting between Jew Jews and Christians. And uh, there is a suggestion that, um, that the Jews had uh, retaken Temple Mount and had started to uh, practice uh, their worship for the first time in, uh, in over 500 years. They're now able to pray on the site of their temple. Uh, the rebellion is crushed in very short order by the Byzantine authorities um, and uh, or the city authorities. And by this stage, they're, they're besieged by the Sasanians. So it might not be really accurate to call them Byzantine authorities anymore. But, um, but the rebellion is crushed and the surviving Jews, according to uh, Sebios and the, uh, the Chronicle of uh, Sebios, the Armenian history, uh, the surviving Jews, he says, leapt from the walls and, and, uh, and disappeared into, into the hinterland. So they are the Byzantine flag now flying over, or oh, the Sasanian flag is now flying over Jerusalem, uh, 614, um, the Sasanian Empire captures Jerusalem. This is six. This is about midway through the Byzantine Sasanian War. Um, uh, the Sasanian army is marching. Um, it, it captures Damascus in 614, and th there are Byzantine, or, or you might call city authorities. There will be some administration going on, and the Sasanians are, are really wielding the power at this stage. Um, I think um, I'm reading at the moment the uh, the last great war of antiquity, which describes a a, 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 a Sasanian delegation in Jerusalem, this, and, and the city authorities are anxious to cooperate with it as much as possible. So, well, as we know, in 628 Heraclius uh, effectively wins the war, 
and um, and there is uh, something that I summarise here as a forcible conversion of the Jews. There are, are reports there in chronicles that um, Heraclius yeah, repays the Jews for their their lack of loyalty to him uh, in his moments of need um, by requiring all Jews to convert to Christianity or to leave the or to leave his empire. Um, the Doctrina Jacobi, which I'll come on to, is of course one of the best known examples of this because that is the story of a Jew who has been forcibly converted in around this period. Um, right, so forcible conversion of the Jews or alternatively expulsion of the Jews from the Byzantine Empire. Now, we move on to the Armenian chronicle of Pseudo Sebius. Um, this, you, your channel, Jay, has, has gone over this uh, a great many times, so I'm just going to very, very quickly summarize it. It talks about the Jews being expelled from Edessa by Heraclius, and it talks about this is part of Heraclius's plan at the end of the war to convert or expel the Jews, and Sebios talks about the Jews, quotes, taking the road through the desert to Tashkestan to the sons of Ishmael. That is what Sebius says. So the Jews, um, some of them are in Edessa. Heraclius retakes Edessa, tells them to get out, and they go into the desert to a place that is described as Tashkestan, the sons of Ishmael. Uh, continuing the story, Sebius says that the Jews, quote, called the Arabs to their aid and familiarized them with the relationship they had through the books of the Testament. I think he means the Old Testament. So Sebius is saying that the Jews and the uh, are, are trying to befriend the Ishmaelites by explaining that they are both Abrahamic peoples, that the Jews are the sons of, Is uh, the sons of um, Israel, of Jacob, and the, um, and, and the Ishmaelites are obviously the sons of Ishmael, but they have this common heritage. That's essentially what he's saying. Here's a crucial period, the crucial, uh, the crucial passage. In that period, a certain one of them, that's one of the Ishmaelites, a man of the sons of Ishmael named Muhammad became prominent. A sermon about the way of truth, supposedly at God's command, was revealed to them and Muhammad taught them to recognize the God of Abraham, especially since he was informed and knowledgeable about Mosaic history. Because the command had come from on high, he ordered them all to assemble together and to unite in faith. Abandoning the reverence of vain things, they turned towards the living God who had appeared to their father, Abraham. So from somewhere, amongst the ma a man of the sons of Ishmael arises, who calls himself Muhammad, and he seems to know a lot about the, uh, the Bible, and he preaches them to, uh, that the Israelites and the Ishmaelites should, quote, unite in faith um, in the name and turn towards the God who had appeared to their common ancestor, Abraham. Sebios then tells us that the Jews were then divided amongst the Arab tribes and he led them via Paran to Reuben's land. So there's, there's critical. Muhammad, this person who arises from the sons of Ishmael, uh, seems to organize um, the, anyone who will follow him into what is effectively an army. And he seems to have more Ishmaelites than he's got Israelites. So he divides the Jews amongst the tribes that he leads. And then he leads them via Paran to Reuben's land. Right, so we now return to the map and try and plot what happens next. Oh, we can, put, we can put this information in on the map first. So you see Jerusalem there, now with the Byzantine flag flying over it. We can't say for certain that the Jews who Heraclius expels from Edessa are the same Jews the Sebius describes having been chased out of Jerusalem, but to me it seems like a, a reasonable supposition. It seems perfectly reasonable that if the Jews are, are, are expelled from Jerusalem in 614, when their little rebellion fails, that these are the same Jews who end up getting expelled from Edessa uh, 14 years later. 
Sebius tells us that they leave Edessa and they go into the desert to a place he calls Tashkestan, and there they meet with a person who Sebius describes as Muhammad. So there I've got Tashkestan. It's not very precise. Uh, Joe will, will probably tell me I've put it in the wrong place. Um, but there you are. That, that's, it's in that general neck of the woods. Yeah, and Joe, there is... To be fair, it's just a little further north. It's right where the tip of the Blue Arrow is. That <laughs> Between the two, you can see the two rivers there. You have the Euphrates and the Tigris. Uh, it's right up, maybe about another person's length uh, that uh, further north. That's all. There is then a gap in the narrative. Sebius tells us that um, the Muhammad uh, united the the Jews and the and the Arabs, the Israelites and the Ishmaelites. He says that Muhammad united them um, in faith. And the next thing that happens is hundreds of miles away. Sebius tells us that he organized them and they enter into Reuben's land, that would be uh, Palestine, southern part of Palestine, via Paran, which is that area just next to the um, Sinai. Everything here is a little bit precise. I don't want to get pinned down on, on exactly where I put my arrows, but it's obviously it's quite a long way from Edessa. You wouldn't walk out of Edessa heading into the desert and find yourself coming up into Israel. You... you at some stage, there is a, a break in the in the narrative, and the people who Muhammad united in Tashkestan end up entering uh, Jerusalem for uh, entering uh, Palestine from the south. That's what Sebius tells us, and I'm going with the evidence. I'm following the evidence. I'm not. Uh, I'm not arguing with Sebius. I want to interpret him. Right now, we have a plethora of sources that tell us that Muhammad was campaigning in Palestine and tell us how the campaign went. I should say the most controversial part of my video probably is that I, I suggest that Muhammad was based in Yatrib. This is part of the traditional narrative, but I see no reason to dismiss it out of hand because something is told by the 9th and 10th century sources doesn't mean that it's necessarily untrue. Uh, I would say that Yatrib is referred to as a base in the Quran, it's Surah 48. It's also referred to in the uh, constitution of Medina. It's also referred to in the Khuzestan Chronicle and in the common Syriac source of uh, the Chronicle of Theophilus. So it, it's, a, it's an optional part of my narrative. You don't have to accept that it's, I know, uh, I know Jay disagrees. One doesn't but have to accept. Thing here, just to help people out, uh, you, you, yeah. are, you are gonna get some uh, uh, kickback on this. The Surah 4824 is Mecca, not Yathrib. It doesn't refer to Yathrib, it refers to Mecca. Uh, that, uh, the other ones that you're referring to, and remember, these are all from the 9th and 10th century that he's getting his material from. Uh, your sources from. So that's not a problem. We can leave it there. But I think you will. And, and again, people do come back to Paul on this, see what he says, because he will try to respond to it. But nonetheless, continue on. This is good. This is the kind of stuff we want to hear. OK, well, you can, you can take or leave uh, Yatrib for these purposes. But Sebios definitely tells us that Muhammad uh, ended up somewhere south of Edessa and he ends up entering Palestine from the south. And Yatrib, it doesn't seem to me out of place that that might be somewhere that he might use sometime in between 628 and, and the, when his campaign seems to start in the 630s. Except right. there's nothing going on down there. There are no civilizations, there are no peoples, and there's there are just little hamlets. It'd be odd why he's yes. that far south. Anyhow, a good, a good, a good place, a good place to prepare your forces, good place for training, Jay, maybe. Um, quite possible he came up by boat. I don't rule out uh, there are seafaring verses in the Quran. You, and, remember, um, you haven't watched our videos on what we now know about the Red Sea. All of that happened on the African coast. There was nothing on the Arabian coast. Again, Jeddah did not exist, so you can't use the sea there. Jeddah did, was not introduced until the 8th century. Yeah. But... Let's move on to what we know then. Let's let's start with the ev let's follow the evidence. If you don't like Yatrib, let's leave Yatrib out of our out of our equation. But let's um, let's look at the evidence. Well, one piece of evidence 
is a, a, a ruined mosque at, uh, at a place called Ayla, also called Aqaba, which is at the top of that, uh, that inlet in the, um, in the southeast of the Sinai Peninsula. Um, this is a very early mosque. It's, it's uh, quite possible that its Qibla actually faces to Sinai, which is very strange. Um, it's one of the very few mosques that we don't have any supposed date as to when it was built. Most of the books that Dan Gib most of the mosques that Dan Gibson talks about in his book and on his website, um, he can say, well, this this was apparently built by such and such a person at such and such a time. We can't know that that's certain, but we normally have a story for it. The, the Ayla and Aqaba mosque, no one knows when it was built. It, it looks like it was very old to me, and it could be. In fact, the fact that it points to Sinai seems to me to make it very, very old indeed. And this is exactly at the point where one might expect an invader coming up from Paran might stop and establish some sort of bridgehead, whether he comes by sea or whether he comes by land and wants to have some, some access to the coast. It seems like a reasonable place the military person might want to seize. A rather strange, rather bizarre coincidence. Can, can is I just this yeah, at this yeah? point? Another thing that you could point out is that almost all the trade that came up through the Red Sea via the African coast then made two branches. One went up through Egypt, which would be towards the west, and the other went up the Gulf of Aqaba, exactly what you're saying, to what is today Elat, which would be part of Israel. Yes. And uh, that's, that would make sense then, that, that if they're coming up, if they are coming up by sea, they would not be coming up on the Arabian coast. They'd be coming up Gulf of Aqaba, past the Tiran Island, up to the north, and then from there they would uh, uh, hit land and head on up to, towards Jerusalem. Well, that that wouldn't that wouldn't surprise me in in the least bit, Jay. That's not uh, that's that wouldn't be a any problem at all for, for my thesis. Uh, the Quran contains um, quite a bit of Ethiopian vocabulary at this stage, uh, particularly the word Rahman uh, seems to enter into the Quran at at, at, at some mid midway point. So about half about half of the Quran surahs refer to Rahman and about half don't. So it's quite possible that he had contacts with, with Ethiopia at this time. The one thing that I, I make a note of there that's a rather strange coincidence is um, this, this name Aqaba, because it is traditionally said that there was a pledge of Aqaba. That is where some Jews pledge allegiance to Muhammad. And it does, I, I Take it no further than that, that it's a rather strange coincidence that the, that the traditional Islamic narrative talks about, not the Jews, it talks about um, a, a group of converts pledging allegiance to Muhammad at Aqaba, and here you have a very early mosque at a place called Aqaba. I make, I make no more point on that, it's just a strange coincidence. The first fairly definite reporting we have of Muhammad is... Um, of course, Thomas the Presbyter, who writes it in 634, in February of 634, uh, he, he describes a battle in Gaza between the Romans and what he calls the Taye of Muhammad, the Arabs of Muhammad. And he describes that the Taye have ravaged the whole region. So one sees the beginnings of a, of a pattern developing here. That's exactly where one would expect um, the sort of region would expect the fighting to start for somebody who is entering the land of Reuben from Paran, which is what Sebios says. So if you came in by a Reuben, by Reuben's land, uh, which I assume is in the south of Palestine, um, you'd expect somebody might well capture um, Ayla or Aqaba as a strategic port and then a line of communication source of supplies and then move on to uh, to do a bit of raiding around Gaza exactly what one would expect in 634 in Christmas time um, uh, Sophronius describes in his sermon his Christmas sermon that year that he is unable to celebrate Christmas mass at Bethlehem as he would like. Um, the reason for this is because he says the godless Saracens have captured Bethlehem. So uh, February, they, they're in um, 
February they're in um, Gaza and by Christmas time they've worked their way up to Bethlehem and Bethlehem of course is only a few miles I think it's six miles it's, it's, it's fairly close to Jerusalem so by this stage they are they are camped on the lawn as it were outside their their military objective as I would say now the next source next vision source we can't really fix a precise date or a precise place on what it says but this is the Doctrina Jacobi. Um, most people, by which I mean Stephen Shoemaker, uh, thinks that uh, people who follow him think that the Doctrina Jacobi was uh, was completed by 640, um, but before 640, so it's quite a, a contemporaneous or near contemporaneous source. Uh, and this describes somebody called the Candidatus uh, being killed by the Saracens, the speaker which doesn't concern us for these purposes, says, I was at Caesarea and I set off by boat to Sycamina. Uh, the people were saying the Candidatus has been killed and we Jews were overjoyed. And they were saying that the prophet had appeared coming with the Saracens and he was proclaiming the advent of the anointed one, the Christ who was to come. I don't want to get bogged down in the precise details of what this says, simply to say that there is evidence here that the Saracens are, uh, are militarily active in this region at the, around this time. And that they've got, they're not just militarily active, but they've obviously got a religious, they've got a religious um, motive, or they're presenting what they're doing in religious terms. Their leader is described as a prophet, and, and there is talk of the anointed one, which I think... Um, may well be uh, the way that Muhammad or the Quran author was describing himself at this stage. Now, something very, very interesting. Uh, I assume, Jay, you've done a video on this, but um, if not, it's probably worth revisiting. And that is the Church of the Katisma. Um, this uh, Stephen Shoemaker, um, in an article called Christmas in the Quran, has demonstrated that the Quran um, author or one of the Quran authors uh, was familiar with this church. It's the church that lies about halfway on the road from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. And because of an oddity of church history, uh, the Church of the Catisma seems to combine two different stories. However, they're combined in the history of this church and they are also combined within the Quran in Surah 19. And Stephen Shoemaker makes, I think, a compelling case that they that this isn't a coincidence. This would only be because the Quran author was familiar with this church. That is why he would combine these two stories. So if you're not familiar with it, look it up. Christmas in the Quran by Stephen Shoemaker. No connection to the book Christmas in the Quran, which is by Ibn Warak, which is something completely different. Then we have the British Library Gospel Fragment, um, which describes battles involving Muhammad up in Galilee. Uh, it's in a very poor state, or so lots of words missing from it. But you can make out that, um, that there's somebody called Muhammad the Tayyi, or there's something of Muhammad, and we know that there are battles going on. And from the traces that are contained in this fragment, um, it's been pinned down to 637. So, at the conclusion here, I, I, I would place Muhammad um, pretty, pretty much in control of the Jerusalem environment. I don't think that Muhammad, I don't think the Quran author, uh, the principal Quran author, captured Jerusalem. That's another story. Um, but what I do say is that if you look at this evidence, if one looks, even if one dismisses Yatrib, um, if one looks at the, the rest of the evidence, the early Ayla Mosque, the uh, Thomas the Presbyter, the Doctrina Jacobi, Sophronius, the Gospel Fragments, um, there is ample evidence, the Church of the Catisma, there's ample evidence that the Quran author was active around Jerusalem at around this time. And of course, Jerusalem itself falls in around about 637 and 638. So although the historical sources aren't great, and although nobody has actually sat down in the ancient world and written down what happened in a, in a form that has come to us in the present day, 
nevertheless, I would say what you have here is a, a, a clear historical trail, a trail that you can follow uh, of, of Muhammad or, or the Quran community. Um, it, it starts outside Edessa, it then comes up for the south, and there is evidence here in all these sources showing that the Quran author is not only talking about capturing the Masjid al-Haram. He's not only talking in some vague sense about people having been expelled from Jerusalem. He's actually leading an army which comprises people who have been expelled from Jerusalem and that he is actually fighting and they are fighting on his behalf to recapture Jerusalem. It's exactly what the Quran says and if one interprets the Quran, as I have suggested should be interpreted, it matches very closely the historical evidence. The Masjid al-Haram has numerous points of contact with the Jerusalem temple, the, the Abraham, the cube, and so on. Yeah. The Quran tells its audience to fight to capture the Masjid al-Haram and to expel its enemies from where they have expelled you. My thesis is that the Masjid al-Haram is Jerusalem. And when one looks at the history, what does one find? One finds a party of Jews being expelled from Jerusalem in 614. One finds a party of Jews uh, linking up with Muhammad, um, recorded by Sebius. We see that same party of Jews, according to Sebius, then led by Muhammad, then invading uh, Palestine from the south. Uh, going into Reuben's land by a paran, and then the historical sources around that time, Thomas the Presbyter, Doctrina Jacobi, and so on, um, all give ample evidence that the Quran author was in fact leading an invasion to capture Jerusalem, which is precisely what the Quran says he's doing on my interpretation. Okay, if we can finish very, very quickly, roll forward what happens next. Uh, we see a little timeline here. You see the byzantine sassanian War up at one end, and then Muhammad's Palestine campaign, which I put between 634 and 638. Ignore, ignore that bit about the Kingdom of Hera. Well, th that's not relevant here. What we know is from Sophonius and from Sebius, is that the first thing that the um, what, what, what uh, Sophonius unkindly calls the godless Saracens, the first thing that the godless Saracens or the Arab conquerors do when they enter um, Jerusalem is they start to build something on Temple Mount. Uh, Sophonius says they immediately proceeded in haste to the place which is called the capital, that is um, the uh, uh, that, that is the Temple Mount, uh, Ela Capitolina. And in order to clean that place and to build that cursed thing intended for their prayer, and which they call a mosque and presumably a masjid. He's got, he's got another word, but it equates to a masjid. And you see the pseudo Sebius from 30 years later and, and writing from Armenia. He says something that's a little bit different, his story. So, so Sophronius is more to be preferred, uh, but Pseudosebius says, uh, locating the place called the Holy of Holies, they constructed the temple with a pedestal to serve as their place of prayer. Um, this, uh, this is the Jews, the Jewish rebels, but the Ishmaelites envied the Jews and expelled them from the place and named the same building as their own. So there is a disagreement about who laid the first stones, but the gist of it uh, the, seems to be the same, that the first thing the conquerors did uh, was to build a place of worship on Temple Mount, which is exactly what I would say one would expect the uh, the Quran audience to do, given its incentives to people to fight to capture Jerusalem, in imitation of uh, of um, the Israelites of old. Then, as we know, um, uh, Mel's. Um, uh, has shown that there was an earthquake somewhere along these lines. And the next thing we know is from the, uh, the traveler Arkulf, who, uh, who writes, uh, where once stood the temple, the Saracens now have a quadrangular prayer house. The building, it is said, can accommodate 3,000 people at once. So this is Arkulf uh, giving his account 
to um, the Bishop of Iona in 600, between 670 and 680. So from the initial shrine, it appears that they now have a very extensive uh, place of worship built. And then, of course, about 10 years after that, or 10 or 20 years after that, we see um, Abdul Malik building the Dome of the Rock. Again, this, this magnificent, splendid shrine over the very place that one would have thought was the Holy of Holies and the, uh, and the tomb, I uh, thought another tomb, the place where, where Abraham was due to have or was told to sacrifice his uh, son. So what one sees here is a, is a, a, a pattern that the Arab conquerors treat Jerusalem as being the focus of their spiritual landscape, their sacred landscape. They are looking at uh, Jerusalem, they're building a shrine there, and then a prayer hall, and then another shrine. And, um, and this, is, uh, this is obviously Jerusalem is where they are thinking about. This is all, as, as Jay, you know very well, this is all 100 years or so before we have any real, or not quite 100 years, getting on for 100 years before we have any reference to, uh, to Mecca in the Hijaz. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So last, last slide, just to very quickly wrap up, multiple points of correspondence between the Masjid al-Haram in the Quran and the Jerusalem temple, supported by other Quranic references to Jerusalem. Dozens of them, more than you can wave a stick at. Um, the concern with Jerusalem temple completely supports the Quran's key themes. It's, 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 the, um, it, it's where Abraham, it's where Moses, where Jesus, they would all, if you ask them, knowing what we now know, they would say that it was Jerusalem that was a holy, of, holy place of worship, uh, not anywhere on the Arabian Peninsula. The historical sources show that Muhammad was indeed campaigning to capture Jerusalem and indeed did capture Jerusalem exactly as, or his people, his army captured Jerusalem, exactly as the Quran would lead you to think if the Masjid al-Haram was the Jerusalem temple. And the Arabs' uh, focus on Temple Mount from 637 to 692 shows that Jerusalem was of the utmost religious importance to them long before anyone mentioned Mecca. So there's the Jerusalem thesis in its nutshell. <laughs> You've done a great job. Okay, let's unshare your screen. Well, thanks so much, uh, Paul. You said some things here that are going to be um, disputed by others. Uh, not everybody uh, would take the view that this is a monk. Uh, this is Muhammad, who is way up there, uh, that would take the view that he actually comes from Yathrib and that he actually uh, was involved in all of these different places. You've heard Joe's thesis. You've heard Mel's thesis. Uh, they believe that this is Omar or Amar or Ambrose, or this uh, could even be uh, Nehemiah ben Hushiel. And there's lots of different people that are that uh, that could have taken on this mantle named Muhammad because Muhammad was a very common name. It was used by lots of individuals, and it would be a title that would have been uh, engendered for for people who were and, and as you notice were leaders but you have really sh uh, given us a good overview this is an overview of your position i don't think too many people would dispute that many of the much of what we're seeing in the quran can be found in jerusalem and surrounding area i don't think that's the controversy i think the controversy is going to come out with what you did in the later slides there when you talked about this man muhammad before we go who nobody in? nobody nobody jay nobody enters into this into this uh, field without being uh, without <laughs> being prepared for a little bit of controversy you don't obviously you don't think umar or amar or umar or ambrose is muhammad you don't think that nah nah nehemiah ben huziel is muhammad so who is muhammad um well as there's a there's a uh, a good question i wouldn't i i wouldn't say that I have a name for him. 
Um, I'm I, at the moment. I'm following the evidence, and I, I like Sebius's description. Sebius was writing about 30 years after the event. It's perfectly feasible that people would have found their way to Armenia and would have told him what had happened and he'd written it down. So I see no reason to dispute what Sebios says. Uh, some aspects of Sebios are corroborated by, by more information. So for example, Sebios describes them uh, entering Canaan or entering Palestine, and, and that's supported by evidence like Thomas of Presbyter. So I kind of follow Sebius. And all Sebius says is, is, is a man from amongst the uh, children of Ishmael, and, and he rises to prominence amongst them at that time. Um, okay, so I, have, I, have, I, have other, I have other bits of nuggets of information, because I think that he was writing the Quran from earlier. And I think that in the early parts of the Quran, uh, before um, before the war turns, I think he's in my earlier one of my earlier interviews with you. I talked about the elephant, and the in the elephant, I think he's attacking or not physically attacking, but he's talking about the Sasanians, and he's using anti he's using the elephant, the companions of the elephant, to um, to criticize the Sasanian Empire. So I think Muhammad or the person who I'm talk called Muhammad, I think he was somebody who was writing the Quran from earlier than the expulsion of the Jews from Edessa. I think that whether the Jews were expelled, he was already underway producing, producing his work. But, um, but my approach isn't to, to find a character from history like, um, like Nehemiah ben Husiel or Ias ibn Kabisa and try and hang the name Muhammad on them. As far as I know, he's, he, he could be some nameless person or whose name, obviously he had a name, but he might be some person whose name we just don't know and will never know, was somebody who adopted the title Muhammad and rose to prominence at that time. And, and maybe we'll never know what his real name was. But he does uh, come from Yathrib. And, she, and um, Jay, let's say, uh, and do you know, for example, what Madonna's real name is? Or Sting. Actually, or I, 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 I can look at a <laughs> I just don't off the top of my head, but it's well known. Yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe Muhammad is like that. I mean, he's one of these people, and no one will ever remember what his, uh, oh, ever find out what his real name is. We all know who Madonna's real name is. It's uh, right there in Wikipedia. You can get it. She does have a name. Most of the movie stars, celebrities have pseudonyms for uh, mm. when they go into when they go into acting. But certainly, it's what you're doing, and I and I. And I, what I what I love what you're doing, you're you're trying to make sense. You're letting us come in our our own interpretation. You have your own interpretation. Not everybody will agree with it. Now, but that's where that's where we need to make sure that people do respond to it. People have been asking, and in quite a few of these videos, well, where and are we going to come to conclusions? Listen, right now we're still putting out green papers. We aren't coming to conclusions, and that's why we need people like Paul, who's done this research for three years. We need people like Mel, who has been working on this almost nine or ten years. And people like our good friend Joe, who's been working at this for 25 years, and uh, the one Odon, who are yet to come on, he will be bringing him on next. He has been working on this for about 20 years. These are the guys who have actually done the work. They've done the research. We're putting out their theories for you. These are green papers. We will come to conclusions in time. But as we talk back and forth and as we discuss and as we engage on this material, you start coming to conclusions, start telling us what you think is happening, because that's how we then all work together as a team. God bless you. It's so good to have you here, Paul. Yeah, oh, thank you very much for having me, Jay. It's always a pleasure to have you. We'll have you back again because we're still not finished with you and your interpretation. This is Jay and Paul then. Three miles apart, 3,000 miles apart, <laughs> over and out.